Hi everyone, welcome to my channel and today we are going to talk about compilers. Uh, a friend of mine is, uh, has started to learn about compilers uh, recently and he's trying his own programming language and I would like to create some videos to somehow explain to someone that is not from computer science how we can tackle this world of compilers. We will do it very basic uh, in a way that is let's say accessible to someone that doesn't have a huge background. So for sure, we'll have to do some compromises, but do not under underestimate the power of what we are going to learn here. Uh, so the first thing, we will use the Java language. Actually, this friend of mine is using Python. So it doesn't matter if you, for obviously I assume that you know how to program if you are delving into the world of compilers, but I don't expect you to know Java, which is the language that we are going to use. Uh, I will use uh, IntelliJ IDEA as our editor. I'll just create a new project here. Uh, let's write it, create it compiler. Uh, and basically we, what we are going to learn uh, is how to create a compiler for a very simple language and we will go step by step very slow. So if you don't know, if you don't know Java, it doesn't matter, I will explain you uh, the basics of the basics. So let's create a file compiler.java and usually you create a class. Let's call this class compiler. And in Java you have this braces syntax. So in case you are using Python, you just use white space. And all programs in Java start from the method main. I think in Python you call them functions, but in Java it's called a method. And in Java you need to specify the return type uh, of everything. So the, the types of everything. It's a statically typed language. So in this case, main will not return anything, so we specify it as void. And we actually have some parameters that are passed from the command line, if you invoke this from the command line, which is an array of strings which are the arguments. And in this case, main belongs to the class. Uh, so it's, a, it's what is called a static method. So you don't need to create an object to actually call this. So we need to specify this as static. And we need this to be able to be called from, from the command line. So if I print line, so instead of doing just print line like you would do in Python, we need to get it from the system class from the out object and then print line and then you can say hello world and if we try to execute this we cannot why can we not execute this first because the class is not public so it's not accessible so if i write public still doesn't work why because main is also not public and now we should be able to run this so now we can run this and we see here, hello world. Uh, this is just to make sure that this, the setup is working correctly. So now what we want to do is start very slow. So we will read, one thing that a compiler has to do is read character by character the input string. So we will start very, very slow with just a digit just to avoid uh, complications, we will use like very simple things because it's enough to learn all these concepts. So in the world of compilers, you need to have a phase that you need to do this uh, synthetic analysis, which means you need to make sense of this huge string, so the program that the person writes, and you need to check if what the user, the person wrote actually belongs to the language or not. And this process is called parsing. So we need to do this part of uh, syn uh, synthetic analysis called parsing. There is a way to specify a grammar. So we need to know the grammar of the language. So a language is defined by grammar. And there is a notation called Bakosnar form that would be something like this. So for sure, if you are in the world of compilers, you already you have already seen this. 
And we will start, just like I said, with one digit, and this digit will be our expression. So we will have an expression uh, produces a number. In this case, just a digit, but let's call it a number. Uh, so this means, so this E is a non-terminal symbol that produces just a number. A number will be a terminal symbol. And this will be our first, uh, this will be our first goal. So sorry for, I just got this uh, Wacom yesterday, this uh, tablet. Uh, oops, like this, with a pen, so that I can explain things properly. And I'm still getting used to this, it's a bit strange. So basically this will be our grammar. So E produces num. And this, what we are going to do is called a recursive, recursive descent parser, uh, which is a class of top-down parsers. So all, all of these concepts, uh, you can then search on Wikipedia if you want uh, to just get some more insights on these topics. But this is what we're going to do. And it's very easy to create a recursive descent parser because you just create a function or a method in this case, because we are using Java, you can call it whatever you want. We create a function for each non-terminal symbol that will match the right-hand side. So we create a function for the left-hand side and we create the code inside for the right hand side. So if you go back to our Java, we need somehow to start reading the input stream. So like I said, our program will be just E, this E. So this E, we will call it expression. And this expression, I mean, right now it does not exist. We'll create method expression. And notice that it creates immediately a static uh, method uh, because it belongs to the, to the class. We don't need to create an object here. We don't care. So what we want with this expression is to actually output code. Uh, so what we will do in this approach, which is not the best, but is enough for you to learn, is we will not divide the compiler into many different parts. We will do, we'll, it will be just one class doing everything. This has its disadvantages and we will probably fix them later, but it will be very, it will be very interesting for you to realize the disadvantage of doing things like this. So basically now what we want to do is do a system out print line of the assembly code that we want to generate. Uh, because in our approach, we will not, uh, we will first compile to assembly code and then we will use an assembler to generate the binary code. But then, uh, to which assembly should we, should we write? So in this case, we will use uh, a standard x86 uh, processor assembly with AT&T syntax, which is uh, common in uh, Unix. So I'm actually using a Windows machine here, but usually I work always with uh, Ubuntu. So we will use the standard Unix syntax, at and syntax. And this syntax would be something like this. So what we will do is once we read a digit, we will produce uh, an instruction that moves this number inside the register. So if we go here, I, I still don't know how to use this program. It came with the with this uh, pen and the tablet thing, so I'll just create a new page. It should be easy to actually clear this, but I, I have no clue how to use this. So canvas. So new, I'll just create a new one. Painter default, particle, portrait. Okay. Let's just use here pencils and uh, we can use this run tip. So yeah, it's fine. 
so basically what we want to do uh, first I, I will actually explain you how this how this works so the processor inside your computer is composed of registers and in the old days when I started using computers many years ago you had 60 16 six sorry 16 bit uh, processors which means that you had the processor let me change the the brush size to just 10 so you had a, a register called AX and this AX was divided in AH and AL so this is the high end part and this is the low end part nowadays we are dealing with 32 bits processors so this has an extended version uh, actually to, nowadays is 64 but we'll get to that uh, so this is now much bigger so we still have this is the, will be the extended part and this will be the old AX uh, we will just use this for now and the instruction the assembly instruction that we want to, to use is to move whatever number the digit that we get and the syntax for this let's assume that the number is three dollar three and we move it to the register eax the percent sign is just to identify this register usually people put here the type so that it's like move long this is a long three to eax but the the assembler is smart enough so that you don't need this I actually don't like to use it so much but you will see it everywhere online um, because the compiler knows that uh, three matches the long and then can put it inside and this syntax means that this will move to this side which is a bit different because when you are using to, uh, when you are doing assignments in most languages for example in case of Python you have X equals 10 and this goes to the left hand side in Java if you do int x equals 10 this also goes to the left side but in assembly with the AT&T syntax it goes to this side this is something that you should not forget uh, if you invert it would actually not make sense in this case but you can really screw up if you get a bit more advanced and yeah, so basically this is what we want to achieve. So we go here. We need to move <clears throat> our number, get number, plus, comma, EAX. So now we need to define this get number. Uh, we can actually return a character here because uh, we don't need a string, it just returns a digit a character. And we will return the character that comes from reading from the standard input. So it would be system.in instead of system.out dot read but you see that IntelliJ underlines this saying unhandled exception Java IO uh, IO exception so we don't want to take care of this exception here so a, an exception uh, would be just like in Python uh, I believe that it's also called uh, an exception in Python when an error occurs it just crashes the program so we will say that we want we, we don't, don't want, want to handle, handle this here we, we just specify that this method will throw an IO exception or might potentially throw an IO exception and someone else needs to deal with this. And here we need to convert it. We need to do a type, uh, like a type casting, because this will return an integer and we want to cast to character. Uh, an integer because it returns minus one if you cannot read anymore. But this you can read from the documentation. So now, because we don't handle the exception here we might we need to handle it here but we also don't want to handle it here we don't want our grammar to handle the exceptions so once again we throw the exception here and here because we also don't care about the exception 
we will say that our main throws IO exception. We don't care about this. Uh, we could do it uh, in a different way. We could do it like surround with try catch and we could somehow write this here. Right now we don't care. We can just leave it like this. Oops. And here like this. So now let's see what happens uh, once we run our program. So now it's waiting for input if we write a D uh, it says move D to EAX and this is not what we want because we need to check uh, if it's a digit or not and this is where a concept of look ahead character comes into play it will be a global variable for us it will be a character it will be private we'll call it look ahead and this look ahead will allow the parser to get the next character from the input stream. So instead of reading directly from this system.in, we always want to read the look ahead, not directly from the input stream. So this means that someone else needs to read this character before for us. So before we start the expression, we need to set our look ahead character our look ahead character needs to be what we read from the input stream and here if we get a number we get a digit we actually do this uh, we output this uh, line Otherwise, we need to throw an error, saying that we expect an integer. Uh, so what we need to do is, if the look ahead is a digit, so this would be equals equals zero, or look ahead equals equals one. So obviously there is a better way to do this. So the character class, already helps us to do this is digit look ahead so if this is true then we return the look ahead otherwise we system out print line integer expected for example and obviously here we could actually turn this around and if and do it like this I believe this nicer like this we here we return the look ahead so this would be one way let's try it again D integer expected but we still uh, we still print the this uh, this uh, instruction and we don't want this we want to abort the program so to avoid this situation one thing that we can do is to actually throw an exception because we cannot recover from this so we would do this something like this throw new let's call it compiler or parsing exception we can call it like this or parse exception but our own parse exception and we say integer expected uh, this would be one way but we want our own parser exception so we can create a class parse exception that extends from exception Hopefully you are familiar with the concept of uh, of uh, inheritance. We need to create a constructor and we call here the reason super dot no sorry super reason something like this 
And here we can say that this throws a parse exception. This throws a parse exception. And here we try catch. And here we print system out. We could also use this one. E dot get message. This could be one way. And now we have this Okay, let's do it again. So D, integer expected. And uh, in red automatically because we output to system.error. But if we run it again and we say 5, we actually move the 5 to the EAX. Uh, and basically that's it. We generate an instruction. You can actually you cannot assemble this already because you need somehow somehow a skeleton for this to to run. But we are not caring about this now. So you can actually it's pretty much uh, working for a single digit. If we output more than a single digit, fifty six, it just ignores the six because we are just working with digits. Uh, so basically that's it. It's quite simple to parse an ex uh, an expression. And obviously, the, a compiler like this is a language like this is not so useful. So on the next video, we will expand a little bit more and make it quite a bit more complicated. So until next episode, I hope you liked this video. If you, if you did, just press the like button and write me in the comments below what, what else do you want to, to see or what, what you don't understand and which kind of videos do you want me to do. So see you next time.